Are we on? Yes. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear myself already. <laughs> Oops. So thanks for uh, coming along. <clears throat> and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the, <clears throat> a tool I've built called Cyberdoge, which I think some of you might have seen uh, already and some of you might have seen me talk about in the Lightning Talks yesterday as well. Uh, the title is The Design and the Evolution. The way the slides have come out is I'm doing the evolution before the design. So that's just the way it came out. Um, I'm self-employed, consultant. Uh, I love fly fishing for salmon. Okay, So if you want to hire me and you're actually qu fairly close to a salmon river, I actually do have a reduced rate for that. Okay. <laughs> so the story starts in two late 2009. I was doing some consultancy for a truly, truly awesome company in Oslo. And uh, Uncle Bob Martin <coughs> was uh, doing some work for some other company in Oslo at the same time. <coughs> and as is the case, word got around and some of the local startup people who organised the local startups asked him if he would do a, an evening session. So he said, yeah, he'd love to do an evening session. And it ended up in this pub uh, right in the middle of Oslo called The Scotsman. Uh, and Uncle Bob at the time <coughs> was very uh, into uh, coding dojos. If you don't know what the word dojo means, <coughs> it's literally the, the, a Japanese word that means the place where martial artists practice their martial arts. It's, it's the physical building. Okay? And that idea of practice is, is crucial, as we'll, as we'll see. <coughs> so uh, we met at a certain time, and Uncle Bob picked the exercise, which was battleships. <coughs> he also picked the test framework that we were going to use, and I can't remember what that was. Uh, and, he, and he also picked the language we were going to use, and I, and I can't remember what that was either. It doesn't matter, which is why I don't remember it. Um, there were about 30 or so people, and we split into five or six groups. Um, and then Uncle Bob said, go. <clears throat> we had about 90 minutes of coding, I guess. Uh, and the idea was that each of the teams would then show each of... Uh, one of the laptops that they had been working on would connect up to a projector, like I just did there, and show their work. And then the next one would come up and connect to the laptop, uh, their laptop to the projector and show their work. All the groups, all six groups would do this, and then uh, that'll be it. <clears throat> so uh, what do you think happened? Some two particular things derailed the session to, to some quite considerable degree. Can anyone guess what those might have been? Language preference is always an issue because you weren't allowed to pick your own language, as I recall. <clears throat> I, I, I can't recall what the language was, but he did pick it. Okay, so it's related to that. The first one, no one had the right connectors. <laughs> and that's the other one. <laughs> okay, so the two issues were <clears throat> connecting their bloody projectors, connecting their laptops to the projector. Some of them were Linux boxes, some of them were Windows boxes, some of them were Mac boxes. It was unbelievable. Things are a bit better these days. This was 2009, remember? Okay. In a place that wasn't really set up for you know techie stuff, it was just a pub. We were upstairs in a room in a pub. Okay. Unbelievable amount of time got wasted just trying to get the damn laptops connected. Okay. And the other thing that happened was that two of the groups sheepishly said, "I'm sorry, we haven't really haven't got much to show because we've been attempting for the 90 minutes to install the language and test framework that you specified at the beginning." And they hadn't, for whatever reason, you know, the kind of things that happen, right? Okay. So it was a bit funny. Those two things didn't make it the greatest of evenings. Um, and the third thing was that Uncle Bob then pr pronounced one of the teams the winners. <laughs> Which I didn't get at all. <laughs> but I guess that's sort of the, without being mean, the American mentality maybe. Okay. So I was thinking in my room, my hotel room that night about those problems. What would the solution, what could a possible solution to those problems be? And fairly obviously, it's to do it on the cloud, right? If all the compilers and test frameworks were installed on some server on the cloud somewhere, <clears throat> and you had a, some uh, way of actually programming that, you write the code in the, you know, some coding editor on the browser, and then when you want to run the tests in your, in, that you've written for your code, uh, you submit it to the server and the server runs it. Then you wouldn't have to install anything. And of course, that also solves the second problem because none of the laptops would have to be connected to the projector at any time. Uncle Bob could have left his laptop connected to the projector through the whole session. 
And when time was up, he would just, assuming it was, you had the ability to do it, we could just look at everyone's code. Yeah? And the more I thought about that idea, the more I really, really liked it. <clears throat> For a number of reasons that we'll see as I talk about the, uh, not so much the design of CyberDojo, but the value system that lies underneath it. Okay? And again, that comes back very strongly to the idea of it's a practice environment. So as I hinted at when I did my introduction after the keynotes, um, when you're using a, you know, a regular, normal coding environment, you've got everything set up to optimize for speed, basically. You want to finish coding, get the damn thing shipped and out in the field so hopefully you can make more money, which keeps you in a job and the ball keeps rolling. Okay? That's fine. <clears throat> uh, but what if you don't want to optimize for speed? What if you want to optimize for learning? Because a big part of learning is going slow, right? So the more I thought about it, the more I liked that idea. And sometimes in life, there's a moment when you think, yes, for whatever reason, you're going to decide to actually commit some time to something. And that was a moment for me, OK? So <clears throat> I spent a fairly large amount of time working on this project, not least of all because when I started, I was a typical sort of systems background person, OK? I didn't know any uh, HTML or any CSS or any JavaScript or any of the dynamic languages like Ruby that get used more and more on the servers and that kind of stuff. Uh, didn't know any of the web stuff, basically. So I, it literally was rolling up my sleeves. So this was a snapshot of the repository holding the code base, part of the code base. Uh, yesterday, just coincidentally, it's, it's 8,888 commits. <laughs> <clears throat> Which shows you, you know, not all of those commits are mine, uh, but most of them are. And it, uh, it's... It's proving to be quite popular, and I've really enjoyed doing it, and it seems to be scratching an itch. It's getting more and more popular. So uh, I'm going to summon the demon gods and actually not only do a demo of the CyberDojo itself, but I'm going to try and demo the installation process too, which you'll see in slide terms later on. So if we just quickly go to... I'm on the, I'll just set up a server on the Google Cloud here. If we don't have enough bandwidth here, I'm not going to do this, but it would be nice if I could do this. At least set it going in the background while I do the rest of the slides. Yeah, OK. It's not looking good, is it? Maybe we'll come back to that. No. OK. Maybe we'll try that again later on. But I can at least do a demo of using it. That would have been a demo of installing it if you wanted to run your own server. Okay? For some people, that's an issue. I've got a friend, for example, who works at a bank, and they, even though it's not real code, it's just test code, play code, there's just no way they can allow uh, code that is written inside the building to go outside the building to some server that is, I think it's in Ireland, okay? my server. So they have to run their server inside their firewall. And uh, I've done a lot of work to make that easier. <clears throat> I was going to show you that, but uh, the joys of not having internet. But we can at least see it in practice locally. OK, so this is my uh, local version running. Again, I'm not going to go to the main server, given that I seem to have problems with the internet. But you have to, you'll see later on why I can be really sure that this is this, exactly the same. So this is my local machine here. And the way it works is, from this home page here, you click set up a new practice session, <clears throat> and then you have a choice of languages. So just like with Uncle Bob, we select the language. <clears throat> There's a plugin framework so you can install your own language if you want to. I didn't by any means do half of these. Uh, what was the last one that got added? I think it was Swift. Byron added that. Is, is Byron here? Good one, yeah. So you pick your language, and then you pick your test framework. Some languages, there's only one test, test framework, but some there's quite a lot, OK? One that got added recently by my friend uh, Seb was uh, Cucumber with Spring. So it's changing all the time. But you just pick your language and your test framework. And then you, you uh, can choose an exercise. There's a bunch of pre-canned exercises. These just give you the, the instructions file for that particular exercise. The classic ones start with is FizzBuzz. Then you hit the Set It Up, and you get the ID, the hex ID. And as long as you know that hex ID, you can participate. OK, so again, if we think about what was happening with Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob would have done exactly what you just saw me do. He wouldn't have said, oh, we're going to use this language and this test framework. Please install it. He'd have just made those two selections. And then <clears throat> he'd have uh, 
gone to the enter page. <clears throat> yeah, if you're on the home page and you see the enter button there, you click the enter button, then you get this page. And as long as you know that ID, you type it in. And as long as it's a valid ID, <clears throat> the buttons light up, you can start coding. So that's what each of the six participants, the six groups would have done, right? They click start coding. <clears throat> and then there's an avatar, an animal that gets, uh, there's 64 of them, that gets randomly assigned to any participating laptop. And again, this is quite an important part of the design. What you didn't see me do in any point there, and you won't see me do, is any login. I didn't have to put my name or my password or anything like that, okay? Personally, I, you know, that's just a hindrance. It's a speed bump in the road that will stop people using it. <clears throat> but we nevertheless do need something that represents the identity of the laptops that are participating. Because when we look at the code at the end of the session, we need the identity at that point, okay? There's a bit more to it than that, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So I've been randomly assigned the raccoon, and now I'm in the environment where you actually do the coding and the testing, yeah? And like I said <clears throat> in, the, in the intro after the keynotes, a normal development environment, like Eclipse, Visual Studio, whatever, is designed to help you go faster. It's got color syntax highlighting, it's got refactoring tools, it's got loads and loads of great features, okay? Excellent. But we're not wanting to develop something with the intention of finishing it. This is a practice environment, hence its name, Cyber Dojo. So what I've deliberately done here is make it as different to a normal development environment as I can. It has none of the features that you normally have, partly because I don't want you to go fast, I want you to go slow. That's part of practice, like I said. But also because mentally, if, I, if the environment, even though it helps you go slow, looked visually the same as you know, a proper professional environment, your mind would be suckered in and you'd just default to the practices you use when you've been using that environment. So again, it's a very conscious decision that this looks kind of simplistic, and that's the idea. It's, it, it, it is intended to be simple because it's not a development environment. It's a practice environment. So I've made it as minimal as I can. All you've got is the files here on the left. Yeah, what the instructions was the one we picked because it was FizzBuzz, right? <clears throat> These are bog-standard files that are always the same if you select, in this case, uh, C Sharp and the end unit test framework. They never bear any relationship to the instructions for the particular exercises. Just to help you to get started if you don't know what the, you know, the, the, the most rudimentary syntax is for doing a test assertion, for example, okay? If you want to, you can create a new file, you can rename a file, you can delete a file. Apart from that, all you can do is hit the test button. And then the code gets sent to the server, run on the server, the output is grabbed by the server, pattern matched, and if it, the test ran and you get a failure, you get a red traffic light, and you read the diagnostic, <clears throat> trying to do something to fix it, run the test again, Code gets sent to the server again, same thing, the output's grabbed, pattern matched, all the tests run and pass, you get a green traffic light at the top here, okay? What can also happen is if you make a typo, <clears throat> I use an amber traffic light for that, and we'll come back to that. That turned out to be a really interesting accident, okay? But essentially, that's what happens, yeah? And this is, again, to remind you, this is just the, the raccoons, but if it, using the same... Uh, idea if we were thinking about how Uncle Bob would have run it, there'd have been six laptops. They all would have been doing this, yeah? And Uncle Bob, remember, would have had his laptop connected to the projector from the start. And what he would have done when he goes to this page here, he would have opened a dashboard. And we would have seen everyone's lines of traffic lights going from left to right as things progressed in real time, yeah? No mucking about with laptops. If it was a 90-minute session, Uncle Bob got a 90 minutes to get the damn laptop connected, right? <laughs> then time is called, <clears throat> and what then happens is we can stop the session, and then the, the real reason that I built the tool was each of these traffic lights can be clicked on, and when you click on those, what happens is it gives you a diff from the previous submission to that submission for that particular animal. So this is the raccoon there. This was the second submission. The green two tells us that this was a, it came back as green. These are the files listed on the left-hand side, and this is the number of lines that were removed and the number of lines that were added. And we can literally step by step by step see what each, each laptop did. We don't know who they are. We can just say, oh, the raccoons were doing something here. And we can start to do a really nice review with anonymity. That's important. Yeah, we don't know. I can't, if I was Uncle Bob, I couldn't say, you know, Fred is being an idiot here. What, what the hell is he doing? Okay, But I can say, 
Well, I think maybe what the raccoons were thinking here is such and such. And the raccoons, if they want to, can say, no, 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 what we were thinking was such and such. But it's up to them to reveal who they are. For some uh, places, that turns out to be quite an important aspect of the design. Okay? So that's very briefly how it works. Let's just very quickly see if the, uh, anything's happening over here. Wonderful. So, a couple of things from the homepage I'd just like to emphasise. Uh, it's free for non-commercial use, and basically what that means is if you're using it outside, if, outside of commercial hours. If you're, in a, if you're a programmer and you're using CyberDojo in the building where you work and it's inside office hours, for me that counts as commercial use. Okay? But if you're not using it commercially, and that includes uh, educational establishments, obviously, then it's free. <clears throat> if, you, if, you, if you do need a licence, then you can... Uh, Get one, you just have to apply to the foundation which I've set up, which is a proper registered charity. The reason it's a Scottish charity is because my friend Seb set it up for me and he lives in Scotland and he set a few up before and he, was, he knew how to do it quickly, so he did it. Uh, and as it says, if you missed it on the front page, all the money that gets do either donated or that buys the licences goes towards buying Raspberry Pis for kids. So here's just a couple of pictures of... Uh, some of the places, India and uh, Ireland, there's a few more going out to various places at the moment. Uh, and like I said yesterday, I've actually got a little bit too much money in the foundation at the moment, so if anyone knows of a good cause that we could make you proper use of some raspberry pies for kids, then I'd uh, appreciate a pull for that, okay? As I said, it's proving pretty popular. I haven't, that was actually a couple of months ago. It's probably about 50,000 practice sessions on the server now. Well, remember, each practice session is just the hex ID. That hex ID could be as many animals as participated. And that animal, like the raccoon, might have been two people on the laptop, not just one. So it's no way to know how many people have done it. That's the anonymity coming through again. But um, it, does get, it does get used, for example, for some quite big sessions. My friend Mike ran a, a cyber dojo for a university in Oslo just last week. And he had, I think it was 37 laptops participating. There were 37 animals in a really, really big dashboard, OK? So this is, this is potentially quite a lot of stuff happening here. OK, so I talked about <coughs> the, the, the idea that I come back to just more than the superficial features that you see, but the value system that underlines it. And I've tried to summarise it here on this page. And again, there's the distinction between what you do in a professional development environment, yeah, where ultimately, probably, your aim is to make money, yeah, <coughs> Interesting note here that everything is individual based. The default, very strong default, is one developer, one machine. I was going to say one monitor, but two monitors is probably the more norm these days, okay? Yeah? And the tooling is all set up for that too. If you think about things like Git and you want to make Git have two usernames associated with a commit when it happens, it's good luck, okay? You're going to have to struggle with that quite a lot. There's a lot of stuff that's happening to really reinforce this idea of one person, one machine, okay? And I. I have a sort of gut feeling that I don't like that because I, I like the idea of things being team-based. And that seems to be a theme that has got some resonance in this, in this conference. A lot of the speakers have talked about this idea of, you know, you don't want to optimise the parts of the system. You want, to, you want to optimise the whole system, and that's different. Okay. Finish focused, we talked about. No, it's about learning. It's about slowing down. Maybe you do test-driven development in your professional environment. <clears throat> Often people... Don't. Uh, it's quite hard not to do test-driven development in CyberDojo because, as you saw, pretty much the only button you've got is test. Right? Aim is to work faster. I talked about that. The aim is to work slower. <clears throat> so there's no color syntax highlights. I, I get asked all the time for color syntax highlighting. And I, I am actually thinking I should relent on that, uh, with the caveat that it would be optional. Okay, so when it starts up, there's no color syntax highlighting, but if you want to click the button, then you get color syntax highlighting. Okay, so I'm weakening <laughs> on that one. Time pressure to finish something, it's really about finishing. And this one is interesting, no repetition. As we'll see, very strong aspect for me of using CyberDojo is repetition. So to emphasize that, let me be clear what I mean. Again, if we come back to Uncle Bob's session in the pub in Oslo, he said, we've got 90 minutes, okay, we're going to use all 90 minutes, and at the end of 90 minutes, we're going to try and do a review, okay? No, that's not the way I would do it if I was using CyberDojo. We'd split the time in half, 
and we say, okay, we're going to do, let's say, 40 minutes for the first iteration. Then we do a review. It takes five or ten minutes, hopefully, something like that, okay? And during the review, I encourage people to write down things they see, not necessarily things that are for their animal, but anything they see for any animal, okay? For whatever reason. Whatever it takes their fancy, that's fine. And the idea is that whatever they pick is something that's caught their eye. That's what we're encouraging them to do so that they do the second iteration on the second 45 minutes of the session and they get the chance to apply the learning that they had from the first one. I think that is a much, much better way of doing it, okay? And that's no surprise. It's just the idea of repetition when a big part of practice is repetition, right? So here's an example <clears throat> From one, uh, this was in India a couple of months ago. I ran a, a session with a group. Uh, and just to quickly pick up on a few things, it's not very well, not very easy to see with this colouring on the projector, but this one is an amber. Okay, if you look, at this, if you look very carefully, you can see there's a little grey dot in the middle, whereas opposed to the green one is a grey dot at the bottom. Okay. Do you notice a pattern here? There's another amber. Notice a pattern? This is one of the most common patterns that we see. And, and this is what people would see when we start the review, because this is the dashboard, obviously, OK? We've got the time is the, is the, is the usual x-axis, OK? So what's clearly happening here is that some of the animals haven't learned to go in small steps. They've typed loads and loads of code and loads and loads of tests, OK? And then they hit the button, and big surprise, it doesn't compile. And then what happens is there's a whole bunch of very, quick, in quick succession, a whole bunch of ambers to try and fix up all the you know, typos and errors that they've made, yeah? Whereas other groups, <clears throat> for whatever reason, are, are doing things much, in much smaller steps. So one of the most interesting things to look at when you're doing these sessions is the difference between these numbers. This is the total number of submissions, traffic lights, for the snake, okay? And virtually all of them were amber, and that's the smallest number, along with the frogs, okay? Lotus, those, lots of those are ambers as well, okay? Whereas the largest is the wolf, which is 19, the majority is green. No surprise to me, OK? Because if you did more submissions, you did smaller steps, you were in control more. If you didn't do so many, you weren't in control. And what I love about this, and it wasn't intentional, it's just a fortuitous accident, is how this is an, this is an example of how CyberDojo can mimic what happens in a really, really large waterfall project that might be happening for like nine months a year in just 45 minutes. Basically, what we've got here is a microcosm of waterfall, all right? And when you show this to people, <clears throat> when you're doing a session, as one of my friends said when Ireland, when I first ran a session with him, he said, John, the thing I, one of the things I love about CyberDojo is that there's nowhere to hide, <laughs> right? Because you're just showing people what they've done. They can't argue with it. It's what they've done, okay? And as I said, really important, one of the most crucial aspects of CyberDojo is that we can use the review, we can click on any traffic light and actually look at the diff of what they actually did, right? And they can't say, oh, no, no, I didn't do that. This is what you did, right? <laughs> so there's nice stuff going on here. Again, this was the group in India a couple of months ago. They decided to refactor because they've obviously got some duplication. This is in the test as it happens, right? Whenever you've got duplication, you've got a sign that there's a potential missing abstraction. That was one of the things we learned. And so they've actually refined that. And when we did this, one of the groups, one of the participants, made another observation about a possible improvement on this name. Can you think what it might be? Remove the word if. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you want to make a definite assertion, okay? They do match. But that's the kind, that's just the nature of development, right? You see more things the more you do. OK, so I talked about a little bit about the amber. Let me just be clear about the colouring scheme. Red means, for me, that the tests actually ran and one or more of them failed. Green, the tests ran and they all passed. And normally you've got you know, some kind of TDD state chart that cycles between these two with refactoring going on here. OK, but I introduced this one here. And it turns out to be, as I said, I think one of the most useful accidents in CyberDojo. How does it work under the hood? Let's start to look at that a little bit. <clears throat> There's, I mentioned that it's simply just a regex. So when the tests run on the server, all we do is grab the output, and then we have to pattern match the output here yeah, with a bit of Ruby code. 
who is the servers written in Ruby on Rails. So this one, what's this one for? This one's for Java Cucumber Spring that my friend Seb uh, did just a couple of days ago. Okay. And the output is regex <coughs> based on these regex. This is slash introduces a regex in Ruby, if you're not familiar with that, okay, to give red, amber, green. Okay. So just to tie, I think, just to tie it back to something I said, you can put your own language in if you want to, and your own test framework as well if you want to. How do you do that? You have to set up the, the actual image for the test framework and the, and the language, as we'll see shortly. But then you have to simply make this manifest file which names the files that you'd like to be the starting files for that particular language test framework. Name the extension for when you create a new file. What's the default extension for when you create a new file in the, test, in the environment? What's the name that appears when you're actually setting things up? You remember there was two steps? Yeah, the first step selected the test, the, the language and the test framework. So that's the language and that's the test framework, either side of the comma. What's the actual image that gets to run the code that you've written when you hit the test button. That's a Docker image with this particular name, which obviously has to exist on the server, but if it doesn't, it gets pulled. Okay. And then we get the, the lambda, as I said. Okay. So that's how you get, that's how the server knows and determines whether we get reds, ambers, and greens. And there is actually one other color. Uh, there's a gray. <coughs> um, which we'll come back to shortly, but what that, what the, the reason we need another color is because you've only got 10 seconds. When you hit the test button, they have to complete in 10 seconds. Again, that, I didn't think of that at first. Uh, if you accidentally write an infinite loop in your tests, for example, or in your code, and you run the tests, <clears throat> you're going to wait for the output, and there's going to be no output because it's just spinning in an infinite loop, okay? So if, you, if, the, if the tests haven't finished within 10 seconds, it's assumed that you've written an infinite loop, and it just kills everything and said, sorry, I couldn't do it within 10 seconds, yeah? Okay, that's my reminder, because I tend to lose my voice a little bit, unless I remember to drink. <clears throat> so let's look under the hood slightly. As I said, it was late 2009 that Uncle Bob did the session. <clears throat> so in early 2010, the first commit, I think, was January 2010, uh, I, I built the first working version. And one of the most obvious points about this whole idea is that you're running code that's written on the browser on the server. There are clear security implications for this, okay? And one of the things I pride myself on is what Kent Beck talks about, doing the simplest thing that could possibly work. Yeah? Because this is all done in my spare time. Yeah, I don't want to waste a lot of time doing something that, you know, is, is over-engineered, frankly, because this could have been, you know not particularly popular, and it would only have been my use, and it wouldn't have been a public server, it would just be my server that I set up and ran just when I was doing some consultancy, right? Okay. So initially, as you might guess from this picture, which is not actually a security camera, it's just a cardboard wooden mock-up of a security camera, but if it's night, and you see that in silhouette and you're a burglar, you might think it's a camera, and it might put you off, okay? There, were no, there was no security. It literally, everything literally ran on the server, as we'll see shortly, okay? And the price I paid was frequent backups. So how did it work at first? Like I said, the browsers had the code. They submitted the code to the Rails server, and it actually ran on the Rails server, right? So if we were doing a Python uh, as the language and PyTest as the test framework, and we were writing Python code in the, in the browser, and that gets submitted to the server, the server would have previously had to have installed both Python and PyTest using all the Linux commands that you'd have to know and the magic incantations to get everything working. And then you'd actually have Python and PyTest on the server and it would then run on the server. Okay, there was no security. It was literally on the server. And that worked for quite a while. <clears throat> Just to emphasize that the code here gets actually copied into the raw server. Okay, and that worked for quite a while until 2003 when someone did this. <laughs> Sorry, 2013 when someone, some guy from France did this. Yeah. And he emailed me, he said, John, I'm so sorry. I just assumed that there was security, right? <laughs> and that was the moment when I thought, now I need to do some proper security, because it was actually starting to get quite popular at that time as well, okay? So 2013, I looked around for technologies that can give me some security on the server, and there was this new little technology that was just starting to get a bit of buzz about it called Docker. At that time, it was at 0.3. If you know the history of Docker, it went to open source early 2013, okay? So now what happens is, 
if you remember all these magic incantations that we had to do one time when we were building a server, okay, to get those on the server, we get those same, basically, more or less, those same incantations in a Docker file. Yep. With some extra caveats on the left-hand side, okay? There's a syntax for, a la it's a language that you have to use to make a Docker file. And this uh, might have syntax errors, but the idea is quite simple. Once you've written that, <clears throat> then you use Docker, <clears throat> and particularly the build subcommand of Docker, to attempt to build a, an image, a Docker image, from these. And then once you've done that, you've got Python and PyTest inside that image. Right? Lovely jubbly. And what can then happen, coming back to the same example, is you write the Python code on the browser, the browser gets submitted to the Rails server. The Rails server starts up a container from the image, of, which are from the right image, obviously, based on the fact that you're doing Python and PyTest, like we just saw in the manifest a second ago. Okay, And then it copies the files that you've written into the container, and then it runs them in the container. Yeah, So I use, I use CyberDojo, a Docker in CyberDojo, mostly for, the, for the, that's a, that aspect of the containment uh, but also for another reason, as we'll see shortly. Okay, <clears throat> Make sense? Yeah, cool. So really, all we need to make sure is that these images are available if you want to run your own server. Running your own server at this point became a lot simpler because you just had to make sure that these images were on your server. So the way it works with Docker is quite similar to the GitHub model. You can actually publish the images on a hub, which is a Docker hub. Yeah. So these are various images for various language test framework combinations. This one, this one has, has had the most downloads for people presumably running their own server, OK? Uh, simply because uh, C with a cert was the very first language test combination that I used, OK? Thanks. Uh, one of the next things that happened in 2015 was that I was asked to put more animals in. People, initially, there were only 16 animals. Uh, and more and more people said, oh, I've got too many people. You know, the only way we can do it is if we've got 16 laptops is if you have 10 people per laptop. It doesn't work. Okay? So my friend Dimitro uh, donated some money to the foundation, <coughs> which we used to uh, pay a professional artist to create all of these beautiful images, 16 of which were the original animals uh, and 48 new ones. Okay? Now, at this point, the most difficult problem was if you wanted to set up your own server... It was a lot better than it was, like I said, because of this. Yeah? But you still had to set up the rails on the server. And that really turned out to be quite a thorn. So the solution to that was to put rails inside the server in a Docker image. Yeah? So that was the next step of the evolution. <clears throat> when you're building your own server now, you have to now have Docker installed on the server, but you had to have that before anyway, so that's no big shakes, OK? But the Rails server itself is now also in an image, All right? So in just the same way as previously, you can imagine you know, running a script that did all the magic lines to pull things and wgets and things like that. And maybe it worked and maybe it didn't, or maybe some stuff had moved and the wget fails. All kinds of ways it can fail. These were the kind of problems we had, OK? Well, now, as long as the script worked in the Docker file and we create the web image, it's there. Okay, you're not rerunning the Docker file, you're just pulling the image. The only way that can fail is if you lose your connection to the internet and you can't actually pull from the hub. Okay? So that made a, a, a tremendous difference. Yeah. But if you just leave it like that, it's not going to work. Can anyone see why? Need proxying? No. It's a little bit subtle unless you've got a little bit of Docker foo. No. Uh, well, actually, you're sort of right. This is a slight simplification. There's actually another image, which is an, an Nginx image. Okay, and that sits at the front end just to do the caching of the simple stuff. Okay, and that forwards to the thing that does the actual heavy lifting here. Okay. The problem is that this is now in an image. And an image gives you isolation. It's a container. It, things are contained. When this now tries to issue the lines to run a Docker container, to run some code in a Docker container, Docker is installed on the server, but you're not in the server. You're in a container on the server, which gives you isolation. 
It can't see Docker. That's the problem you now have if you do this, OK? So we have to put Docker <coughs> inside the image, if that makes sense. This is itself a Docker image, and it has to have Docker inside it. This is sometimes called Docker in Docker, which is slightly confusing. It's more Docker next to Docker, because there's really only one server, right? OK. So all the, all the lines that you had to do to actually build Docker, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And the Rails now both have to go into the Docker file to build your server, OK? So this is the stuff for Rails, yeah, which allows us to make Rails. <coughs> and then this is the stuff in the same Docker file to make the same image to allow us to put Docker inside the image. OK? Now, if you're, if you're observant, you'll have noticed we added some version numbers here because we've got two versions of Docker running now. Yeah? We've got Docker on the server, which you have to have to spin up the image, right? But you've also got Docker inside the image to spin up, to run Docker, to run the second level of Docker, which is the ones which actually run the, the code itself submitted from the browser, OK? These two have to have the same version number. If they don't have the same version number, it doesn't like it, OK? So as is always the case with design, you make decisions and it has consequences, OK? This is, this is arguably the, the, the least nice part about putting this in, OK? When Docker upgrades, 1.12.1 only came out last week, I think, or near enough, OK? And I upgrade, um, I potentially still have to support people who are using 1.12.0, yeah? On 1.11.0, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just the usual kind of problem that you get, OK? So the Docker file installs everything you need for Rails. It also installs everything you need for uh, Docker itself. And I'd like to spend the last few minutes just talking about some testing. I have this script file here, <clears throat> which allows me to build the image for the server, which itself contains Rails and Docker, and then run all my tests inside that image. OK? I deliberately don't run my tests in the sense of I run a test locally on my machine, OK? And what that does is, you know, fire something to via an HTTP request to something that's the... That's, that's the, the uh, <clears throat> The, the Rails server, and then that comes in and that spins up a container, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Because that's not what's actually happening. When the, when the code that I've written that I want to test, when that code is actually being run, okay, it isn't being run on my machine, it's being run inside the container, right? So to minimize the gap between what I do when I test and what actually happens in the real situation, okay, I put the tests inside the container. OK, and then I start the container from the image, OK? I shell into the image, and then I run the tests. I don't do it manually, it's a script, OK? OK, so the crucial line here is this last line here. This is all just building the image and making sure it's correct, OK? Bringing the server up, which gives me the web container, OK? Finding out what its identifier is, shelling into the running container, going to the correct directory, and then running all the tests. OK, so all my tests run inside the server. I think that's very important. Come back to that in a second, maybe. I just want to show you what happens, OK? This is the output of what's running when you're running in the server. All these tests that ran are running inside the container. Yeah, and it's, it's true that that container is not running in a server that's an actual server. That container is still just running on my local machine, but my local machine has Docker installed. So the difference between those two situations is now as small as I can make it for these tests, OK? With some definitions of done. Uh, that's just locally, of course. What about when I decide, yep, I think everything's passed? Then I actually want to make it live, as it were. Yep. So uh, on GitHub, if you make a Travis YAML file, you can specify what happens for every commit unless you put a magic incantation in to say, don't do it. There's a, you can say, CI skip, and it skips it. But if, unless you put that in in your commit message, every time you do a commit, 8,888 commits, every time you do a commit, this runs. And what this does, that I've written it to do, is number one, install Docker with the correct versions. OK? And then number two, <clears throat> do what you just saw me do, basically. Run all the tests inside a running container. And again, all of those have to pass 
so that the exit code for the whole run of Travis is zero, which means everything works, okay, hopefully. So this is uh, Travis CI. If you're not used to, if you haven't seen it before, this is each of these on the left is the different uh, GitHub repos. I've split it now, okay. Uh, and this one is for the web, which is the main server, as we just described, that contains both the Rails server and Docker itself in that Docker in Docker way, okay. Uh, and this was the last one that ran, and it took two minutes, 36 seconds. It was green and everything passed, and if you click on that, uh, green link there, then you get to see a whole massive log of everything, okay, But because there's, there's all that installation stuff to actually build and set the environment up. Uh, and then the last thing is it runs the tests, exiting with zero. All that just to get a zero. It's not just me. My, Byron has done a lot of work with the images, so I'd like to say thank you to him. This is the lady who created the beautiful images. Uh, Dimitro was the gentleman who donated the money to pay uh, Nadia. Uh, Mike and Olve um, both work in Oslo, uh, which is not entirely a coincidence, um, and they've been very helpful and encouraged, basically the most thing they, they've really encouraged me. Olve in particular was very instrumental in encouraging me from the start. Mike is a real Docker guru, so whenever I have any Docker issues, I go, I go and help, ask Mike for help. And I make a point of uh, meeting up with him usually four times a year, and we spend the whole day just working on CyberDojo. Sometimes I visit Oslo and sometimes he visits me. And Seb uh, built, set up the charity and also um, has been doing some work on putting the, the, the cucumber images in, as you saw at the beginning. Okay. So we're probably nearly out of time now. Yeah, have we got time for one or two questions? Well, I, well uh, we'll take one question, and then after the question, everyone can go if they want to. How about that? If you want to stay and ask more questions, that's fine too. Any public cyber dojos that people can join on meetup.com or something like that? Are there any public cyber dojos like on meetup.com? Uh, I know people have used it in meetups, okay? Um, and I actually uh, I participated in a few. Um, but in terms of making them, publicizing them at some central point, no, nothing like that I, I currently. But I'm always open to pull requests. Yeah? Thank you for the question. Anyone, you can go now if you want. Yeah. Lunch, very important, but if you want to ask a question, that's fine too. Would it matter? Question was, would it matter if each person set up their own language? That's one of the most commonly requested features. Because at the beginning, as you saw, there's one selection of the language and test framework, and then everyone who joins gets the same language and test framework. All the animals get the same language and test framework. Okay. Um, you could uh, you could do that. And I am, that's something I get requested for. But the main problem with that, obviously, is it would reduce the value of the, of the review when you're doing the review. Because you wouldn't be comparing like with like as much as you are. There would. There would be other things you'd learn. Yeah. My main criteria for making that decision was, again, this idea that when you're in a practice environment, you want to go slow. There wants to be some level of uncomfortableness. If you're not slightly uncomfortable, you're not stretching yourself and you're not learning, Okay. So the fact that people say, oh, I'd like to use JavaScript because I know JavaScript, okay? <laughs> That's my little clue to say, well, you just gave the game away there. The one thing you're not going to get is JavaScript, right? Because we want you to learn something new. But it's a difficult one. Again, if you really want it, I'm open to pull requests. <laughs> Good question. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>